Amongst conversations with ocean liner enthusiasts, it's often said that White Star Line sacrificed speed for luxury, or that Cunard sacrificed luxury for speed. But over the course of time, after learning more about ships, I started to realize, well, that's just not true either way. To understand why people say this, we have to go back to a time when the two great British shipping lines changed the way they both viewed passenger service. It was the decade of the gay 1890s, where luxury and fashion ruled the mindsets of the Victorians. Fashion not just in dress and style, but also in design, accommodation, and what was widely considered trendy. The wealthy corporations and private individuals were constantly competing to flaunt the best of the best. This is why the 1890s was really a fascinating decade for ocean liner fans, because this was when ships competed not only in luxury and size, but also in speed. The shipping lines wanted the coveted blue riband, which was nothing of a physical trophy, but rather a title or accolade that named their ship the fastest to cross the North Atlantic. It goes without saying that passengers who traveled between Europe and North America also found it quite exciting to be on a ship that held the riband. It was a kind of prestige you could brag about when you arrived at your destination. The problem was that, at least in the 1890s, many ships won the riband by a small margin, and they didn't hold the title for very long. In 1891, White Star Line's Majestic lost the riband to Teutonic, which in turn lost the riband to City of Paris from the Inman Line in 1892. Cunard's Campania then took it in 1893, only to lose it to her companion liner Lucania in 1894. The decade ended with the German ship Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse taking the blue riband in 1898, and for 10 more years, the German ships would capture the riband one after another. This crazy competition was not cheap, however. Each ship had to outmatch each other in size and luxury, and then spend exorbitant amounts of money developing faster and faster engines for a speed title that would eventually be stolen by someone else. And the real kicker was that these ships only needed to reach these maximum speeds to capture the blue riband. After they held it, the ships would settle into what's called a service speed, which is basically a fast yet comfortable speed for the engines, and yet also economical. So even though passengers could brag that they sailed on a ship that won the Blue Riband by sailing an average of 22 knots, the reality is the subsequent voyages would travel at a more economically viable 18 knots. It was in the middle of this decade, while White Star Line was still planning for their next great liner, that they suddenly realized they wanted to make a change. When they looked at their speedy competitors, they could see that after the journalists finished prattling on and on about the speed of the latest and greatest ship, then the printers would start pressing out stories of how uncomfortable the voyages could be for second, third, or fourth classes on board. The shipping lines installed whatever engines were necessary to capture the riband, sometimes fully knowing that their ships could vibrate quite noticeably. It's important to mention that the shipping lines usually tried to reduce or fix the issue of vibration, but even still, the riband was a higher priority than that. White Star Line decided that their next liner would continue on the competition of size and luxury, but the engines installed would be ones that were merely intended to keep up with an acceptable service speed, and also be tried and true to ensure minimal vibration. It turned out that White Star Line had made a very smart move, because passengers wouldn't care about arriving at their destination a few hours after the fastest ship, especially not when they enjoyed such a comfortable and luxurious ride. So, that was White Star Line. Cunard, on the other hand, decided to double down on their efforts and design a ship so advanced and so fast that it could hold the riband longer than other ships of its era. The Lusitania and Mauritania would eventually capture the riband away from the Germans and win back Britain's supremacy of the sea. Mauritania herself would end up holding on to the riband for an astounding 19 years. But again, both ships, Lucy and Maury, were known to really shake their second and third class passengers around quite a bit. 
This is what gave rise to the common assumption among Ocean Liner fans that White Star Line sacrificed speed for the sake of luxury, and that Kennard sacrificed luxury for the sake of speed. It should also probably be mentioned that historians have not explicitly made this statement, at least none that I have found. It seems this statement is only repeated among fanatics, and frankly, when I first heard it, it made sense to me, but it simply isn't true. Oceanic of 1899, which was a superliner that was not designed to compete for the Blue Ribbon, had a maximum speed of 21 knots. Compare that to her most formidable speed rival of the time, Kaiser Wilhelm der Gross, with a maximum speed of 22 and a half knots, there really wasn't that big of a difference between the two. If both ships had raced each other across the Atlantic, Oceanic would arrive merely six hours after the German ship. But when you're on a voyage that lasts six days, arriving just a few hours later is really not bad, and the trade-off is that Oceanic was more comfortable. So White Star Line did not sacrifice speed, they simply sacrificed their desire to win the ribbon. As for Cunard and the idea that they sacrificed luxury for the sake of speed, that one is equally false. I think that many Ocean Liner fans consider this period of time as one that Cunard was just some average steamship company that insisted on being the fastest like any other company did. But it's important to note that Cunard ships generally were not considered any less luxurious than White Star Line ships. Actually, the luxury and accommodations between the two transatlantic competitors were more comparable than you might think. Almost any accolade that you could give about the luxury and white glove service of RMS Olympic could more or less be given to RMS Mauritania, with some notable differences. I mean, Olympic had a pool, and Mauritania didn't. Olympic was larger than Mauritania. But this argument is not about size. It's about the white glove luxury service. However, some of you would say that the uncomfortable vibrations on Mauritania made her less luxurious. I suppose if you factor in comfort along with the fancy service, then yes, that would make sense. So to summarize what I'm saying, the beauty of a ship is objective and based entirely on a person's preferences and opinion. But the level of service is a luxury that can be measured. In fact, we do it all the time. In the United States, the AAA often grades hotels, giving them however many stars or diamonds they think it has earned. So between Cunard and White Star Line, their level of luxurious service was pretty much equal. But playing the devil's advocate, take a look at this. This may seem like a White Star Line advertisement for their service, but actually, it is a lapel pin that Cunard stewards and waiters wear on their modern ships. As you might know, Cunard and White Star Line merged in 1933, and since then, White Star Line has been completely absorbed and dissolved. That being said, it seems even Cunard Line acknowledges that there was something unique and memorable about White Star Line's service. If you would like to know more about what made Ocean Liners vibrate, simply click the link in the corner or check the description below. Well, I hope this was an enlightening video. Did you think there was something I missed or didn't discuss? I'm still learning about ocean liners and I want to hear from you about how you view this subject. As always, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more content about the age of steam.